Hi, everyone. Welcome to Begin With In. Um, my name is Jamie Chapman, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Belinda Wilkerson. Uh, she is the founder of Steps to the Future, and she helps families eliminate random acts of college planning. Uh, she's a lifelong educator, and she's done teaching school counseling and school educator positions. She is originally from Rhode Island, and we were talking about the North Carolina heat that she is still adjusting to now. Um, and so today we have some really great things to talk about. We're going to talk about um, kind of reestablishing your professional network after relocating, which is super relevant in my own life right now because I just relocated from Germany to Texas, which is an interesting tr transition. Um, and then there's some other things that we'll talk about as well. Uh, but Belinda, let's go ahead and why don't you go ahead and take the floor and introduce yourself and then we'll get the ball rolling on the interview. Okay, thank you, Jamie, so much. And thank you to everyone out there that's um, listening to us today. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So as Jamie said, I um, relocated from Rhode Island to North Carolina. Um, prior to relocating, I've been working at Providence College as the counselor in residence. And what I did there is I um, was in charge of professional development for all of the school counselors statewide and also representing school counselors on various, um, various state um, teams and organizations, for example, like the governor's PK to 20 um, council. So we always had to make sure there was a school counseling representative there. And then I also taught in the Providence College Counselor Education Program, their career information class. Then I moved. So about 10 years ago, I relocated to Fayetteville, North Carolina, because this is where my husband is from. And he decided after he retired that he was really tired of shoveling snow. So if you're familiar with the Northeast and New England, you know, we get some pretty heavy snowstorms. And when I moved, um, I figured, okay, I'll continue working in the, in the college level as a career advisor or academic advisor. Now, I have a pretty strong resume, so I felt pretty confident about um, being able to find employment. Now, mind you, I had not had to actively look for employment for a number of years. So it was my surprise when I found out after applying to 36, count it, 36, I stopped counting after 36, 36 different positions, whether it was working um, as an academic advisor in the college level or as a career advisor. I even applied to a couple of um, to school counseling positions in public schools, which I really, in hindsight, didn't want to do, but was starting to feel a little desperate at that point. So think about it. You know, I had, had a great job at Providence College, loved everything about it, grew up in Rhode Island, so I had a strong professional network, and then moved here. And all of that went away. But in addition to that, it wasn't just losing that. There were a lot of firsts for me in this move. So it was the first time that I've been unemployed since I was 13. It's the first time since I started school that I wasn't affiliated with the school. It was the first time I, we had an empty nest. Our sons and one of my nephews lived with us. So now it was just my husband and I. So now that was the first time I haven't lived with my kids. You know, we have two adult sons. Um, they did not want to move to North Carolina. So they're in different places. And it was the first time that I didn't have a social network. So my husband's family lives here uh, and I love his family and they're wonderful people, but we kind of, you know, run kind of in different circles and just, you know, had, uh, you know, went about doing things differently. So I didn't have a, my close girlfriend. My close girlfriend was back in Rhode Island, you know, so we used to talk every single day on the phone, every single day. I mean, we would cry and, you know, because we both missed each other so much. Actually, that first year I moved here, I went home five times. And it was so bad. I remember one time I was in the grocery store shopping and somebody said, didn't you move to North Carolina? <laughs> I said, yes. They go, what are you doing in here shopping? I said, well, my son's, you know, kind of helping out, getting some groceries and stuff. So it was like I had never left home. You know, you know that's, that's where I was. But then, you know, it got to the point where, okay, I can only walk my dog so many times during the day. We have two Rottweilers, I love my guys, but I can only do that so many times a day. Um, I, I'm not cut out to be a housewife, so I can only clean house like so much before that loses its um, appeal to me, which is pretty fast. So I had gone home a, you know, 
again one time um, for actually the Rhode Island School Counselor Association Conference. And one of my colleagues who is a, was a um, college admission counselor, she said to me, so what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I can't get a job. Nobody would hire me. So if, if you knew her, you know, this, this is typical reaction for her. She goes, look, you need to get your big girl panties on and do something. She said, because this is crazy. She said, you need to just cut this out. She goes, why don't you become an independent? I said, an independent what? <laughs> she goes, an independent consultant. Now, prior to my doing this, you know, there, there was a lot of angst between school counselors and people who did the work independently because, you know, people felt territorial. And having been a school counselor, I certainly understood that. I don't want somebody coming into my high school um, taking my kids and, and doing something different. You know, those are my kids, you know, so, you know, stay away. So I said, oh, I don't know about this. Let, let me look into it. So what do I do? You know, I start doing my research and I had uh, attended the um, National Association for College Admission Counseling, NACAC, their um, annual conference, which is in New Orleans. And one of my colleagues, counseling colleagues from Rhode Island was going and she said, hey, why don't you come to the conference with me and then we can share a room and all that other stuff. I said, okay. So I went and there was a session there, transitioning to private practice. Went. I listened to it. The uh, presenter was Mark Scalaro, who is the CEO of the Independent Educational Consultants Association, which I am now a member of. And he was saying all the things that I needed to hear. Oh, this is a real thing. Okay, there's a professional association. Then later in the conference, they, there was a special interest group for people who were IEC. So I went to that. And I walked in this room and it was filled with all these people that were doing this work. And I said, oh, okay. So again, I, did, I started doing my homework for you. What do I need to do to transition from being a counselor educator and a school counselor and turn this into a business? What does that look like? Because I have no business background. So again, it was figuring out how to do that. Um, I ended up working with someone who had transitioned from school counseling to this work um, because I couldn't go to this, this summer training institute a particular year. So I ended up working with um, on this woman for six months. She was my mentor and she walked me every, through all the uh, processes and protocols to starting a business. You know, she, she talked to me about you know, creating an LLC and what that would look like. Uh, just about, you know, this is what you need to do about getting your bank account for your business, getting your EIN number, all of that stuff. And she was so good because, you know, I was asking questions that, you know, I thought were pretty, pretty basic. And, you know, I'm like, oh my God, this is like a stupid question. She goes, no, you've never done this before. It's not a stupid question. So with her help, I was able to get my business up and running. Um, the first year I just kind of, um, worked with students pro bono because I needed to figure out what this looked like as a business. I knew the counseling part. I knew how to help kids in the college application process and everything because I had already, you know, that's what I had did my, most of my life. But that business side of it, it was really different. But in addition to that, here I am starting a new business in a city where I really don't know anybody but my husband's immediate family. And I'm like, who do I talk to about this? You know, I love my husband and all that, but you know, you need your girlfriends, you need your people. And I didn't have any. And I said, oh, how do I, how do I find, how do I find my people? I remember one day I had gone to, I was out running errands, you know, Target, Walmart, here, there, grocery shopping, whatever. And I was driving home and I was going over this bridge. And all of a sudden the, the theme song to Cheers came into my head, you know, where everybody knows your name. And I remember I started bawling. I was like, it was that ugly cry. Because I'm thinking like, nobody knows me. They don't know who I am. I've been in all these stores and not one person called me by name. I didn't see anybody I recognized. You know, and I was miserable. I was so miserable. I was, and there was this one part of me that loved that I was starting this new adventure in my career. But the other piece of it was like, I had no professional identity there. Nobody knew me. Even though I have like a, a, you know, a CV that's like, you know, 14, 15 pages long with all the work I've done in education, it didn't matter to people here because they didn't know me. 
So my the professional identity that I had, had since, you know, since I graduated from college and got my first teaching job didn't exist anymore. And I didn't realize how, well, I shouldn't say I didn't realize how much my career was a part of me. I knew it was a part of me. I didn't realize how much of my time was around the work that I did. And now not having that work on a regular basis and not having anyone to talk about that work with. Uh, my husband isn't an educator, so he, you know, he would just look at me, you, know, you guys are always talking about kids, that's what you do. So it, it ended up being, okay, I need to find some way to connect with people. So I would sometimes, you know, rather than staying in the house all the time, I would grab my laptop and I would go to a local coffee shop or tea place or whatever and just work in there. And one time I was in uh, one coffee shop and there were these group of women sitting over there, you know, to the side and it looked like it was a business meeting. I'm like, What's going on here? So I happened to uh, recognize one of the women that was there that I had met somewhere. So when she went up to get something to eat, I went over and I said, what's going on here? So it was actually a women's networking group of um, women entrepreneurs. And I said, oh, so I said, well, how do I join this? She goes, come next week as my guest. So I went that next week as her guest. And that really helped me kind of get over that hump because now I had a place to go every Tuesday morning. I had a group of women that all had, you know, you know varying types of businesses. So that was, that was, that helped a lot. Then I also joined my professional association, that Independent Educational Consultants Association. And they do two conferences a year. And plus, one of the things that we have to do as independents that they really um, strongly encourage us to do is to visit anywhere from 20 to 25 colleges a year. And these, these tours, these college tours are basically organized by different organizations. So um, NACAC, that National Association for College Admission Counseling, may have a tour. Um, SACAC, I belong to SACAC, that's the Southern Association for College Admission Counseling. So they do a tour every June, you know, we missed it this year because of COVID, but they do one every June that's called the Sweet Tea Tour, you know, appropriate name for it being here in the South. And we would visit different schools throughout the Southern states. And so for a week, we'd be on a, you know, charter bus, but we'd be visiting anywhere from 12 to 15 schools in a week. So, wow. yeah, yeah, we're on, on the road again. <laughs> So, you know, it's really interesting uh, to hear your story. And I'm curious, in the military community, um, which is the primary job seeker that we have here at Begin Within, we move a lot. We move every two or three years. And so it's not uprooting our entire lives. It's just the next move on the, you know, the list, right? And even for people with experience moving a lot, um, I've moved quite a bit in my lifetime with the military being the reason for that, it is so hard to meet people. Um, and I find it, you, you throw kids out in the street and they're best friends in five minutes, but it's not the same with grownups. Um, and it's just amazing. I think it takes a lot of guts to walk up to somebody you barely recognize in a coffee shop and just kind of say, hey, what's going on? Can I be in this group? Um, <laughs> so that's something really admirable and definitely noteworthy. Um, when it came to kind of reestablishing your professional network there, your group on Tuesdays with the other women entrepreneurs and doing college tours with these professional associations certainly helped. Uh, do you have any additional tips or tricks that you might recommend or maybe don't do what I did um, to, to recommend to our audience? Well, part of it, you know, again, expanded beyond that one group and finding other similar groups um, that were like that. Um, it was funny. So one of the other things that I said, so actually there was, there's one woman, there was one of the women in our group did social media marketing. So what I loved about this group is there was always an education component, you know, being a teacher, I'm a nerd. I, I love that education piece. So she used to challenge all of us to really use social media in ways that we could market our business. She goes, there's so much out there you could do for low cost and no cost. So how are we going to do this? So, so her challenge to me, was to use Facebook Live. She said, look, you're on all these tours. You should be doing Facebook Lives from the campuses and stuff. I'm like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I make a mistake. It's out there. I don't want to be, you know, out there fumbling at the lips and everybody's listening to me. And she said, 
it's okay. People just want you to be yourself. You need to do this. And I'm like, I'm not going to do it. But then she gave everyone homework and everyone had to do a Facebook Live for you know any amount of time. And she would check our Facebook pages to see whether or not we did it. So I started doing it. And, and for me, that became another way to c- connect with people because, you know, so now I've been doing it for three years. And wow. I, when, you know, every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time, I do a Facebook Live and unless it's Unless, you know, something comes up. Sometimes we're on, if we were on a college tour, we may not get back to the hotel till 10 o'clock at night. So, um, so it was that. But it was also being willing to put myself out there to go to different professional development events. So I remember there was one time there was um, a, a local organization that was having uh, a college admission counseling workshop. And it was at Elon University. And Elon is about... It's about almost about three hours for me. I didn't know anybody that was going. I didn't know anyone to call and say, hey, you know, I'll meet you there. So I just got up early that morning, drove myself to Elon, you know, thank God for GPS, <laughs> and, and went. And, you know, of course, met people there, you know, people that, that lived in Raleigh that didn't live too far from me and stuff, and, you know, and found out, oh, there's this other whole group. And I remember when that weekend I was talking to one of my husband's family members and she goes, Dwight said you went to Elon. Who did you go with? I said, I drove up by myself. He said, did you know anyone there? I'm like, no, but I knew people by the time I left. Now I'm an introvert. (laughs) I'm an introvert. So I really had to come out of my shell. I, I had to figure out, I was more miserable staying in the house and leaving the house so I had to leave I had to, I had to leave the other thing I would recommend to people so um, our cha- local chamber of commerce do all these different you know networking events and networking can feel like a dirty word because you go and everybody's passing out their business cards blah, 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 blah. and I used to go and I'm like oh my god I gotta go in here and talk to all these people blah, 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 pass out cards oh how you doing yeah yeah what do you do yeah, yeah. and it felt like a meat market <laughs> you know it, <laughs> It's just like, oh my God, what are we doing? So there was one time when I had gone to one again. And this gentleman came up and he started talking. He's giving me his car and stuff. I said, do you realize this is the third time that we've met? And this is the third time that you've given me a business card. So you don't even know who I am. And we've talked before at, at different events. So I made up my mind after that. I gave myself permission that when I go to a networking event, if I talk to at least two to three people, I'm good. That's it. No more than that. I'm not working the room. I'm not figuring, oh, I've got to have, you know, 15 business cards when I come back home. No. Two to three people, that's it. The other thing I do when I do talk to those t- two or three people and have their business cards or their contact information, I come home and within 24 to 48 hours, I look to see if they're on LinkedIn. And I send an invitation to connect with them on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the, one of the best networking platforms for anybody that's either, you know, entrepreneur or somebody, or, or you're an employee. It is a fantastic platform if you use it correctly. And, and I love it. I love it. I am you're a- speaking my language. You're yes. speaking my language. So, oh my goodness. I'm a super introvert as well. Um, you know, it's, funny people wouldn't think it because I can, I can work a room and have a conversation with the best of them. And, you know, I do public speaking and things like that, but man, am I tired when I'm done. And so I'm, I'm really resonating with the, the advice of only talk to two or three people. That's all the, you know, that's the goal. Any more than that's just icing on the cake. Um, and then that makes it, um, I heard somebody say this and I love the little saying is don't eat the whole elephant in one bite. Yes. Um, it makes it doable. You know, it makes, if you only have three quality contacts from your networking event, you can actually have a relationship with those people and something fruitful can happen later. But if you meet people, the ease of doing something with those 30 contacts a little bit more difficult if I'm coming home. And then, man, we could have a whole conversation about LinkedIn. <laughs> I just love LinkedIn. So I do. I it's do. one of my favorite networking. And it's funny because I actually have my students, my seniors that um, 
that have been doing things out in the community that have a pretty strong resume. I actually have them create a LinkedIn profile um, before they graduate from high school because they're going to do it when they go to college anyway. You know, the other, the other important thing that I um, had to do, not, well, not didn't have to do it, but definitely wanted to do it, was professional development. Now, when you're working in a public school as I had, um, as, a, as a social studies teacher, which I was originally and then a, a high school counselor, professional development can be spotty um, sometimes, you know, it, it's the administration telling you, oh, you have to do this professional development. And as a school counselor, sometimes some of the stuff they wanted us to do really wasn't about the work I did. Or there would be these wonderful conferences you'd want to go to, but they weren't paying for them. So I learned early on, um, on a teacher's salary, um, to pay for my own professional development if I really wanted to go. So one of the things I did was I, you know, again, looked for those professional organizations that had something to do with the work I was doing. So I joined the Independent Educational Consultants Association. I joined NACAC. I joined um, SACAC, that Southern Association for College Admission Counseling. And I'm also still a member of ASCO, which is the American School Counselor Association. All of those organizations have um, professional journals, magazines, they do webinars, and they have conferences. So I, I spend a lot of time in professional development. Just, just this past month, you know, because everything's virtual, I, um, I've done, uh, actually, I have done, yeah, this month I've done two conferences virtually, did another one last month, um, but it makes it a little easier because the ASCA one I hadn't had an opportunity to go to for a number of years because you can only afford to go to so many at a time and travel around, but because they were virtual, it was more cost effective. So I was able to do that. And what was so cool about it, you know how you go to a conference and you want to go to this workshop and that workshop and they're all at the same time and you can't go to everything? Both of the organizations um, have all of their um, offerings up for an extended period of time. So once the conference ends, you can go back and look at the ones that you missed. And it was, and it was so good. It was such a great learning experience. I mean, I miss seeing my people in person. But well, it gives you the opportunity to go back if you missed something during the one you actually attended. You can go right. back and watch it, and exactly. that's really nice. Yeah, it is. I was talking with a colleague, and she said, "Oh, I was looking on that one on budgeting." I said, "Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. I'll have to go back and look at that." So we, you know, we were comparing notes: which ones did you watch? Which ones did you get a lot of information from? So um, I'll go back and, and watch some of those that I haven't had an opportunity to watch before they go away. That's wonderful. Um, I have a question for you, and this is because I don't know about how you being independent, right, operate. So this goes in part to um, rebuilding your professional identity and you moving to a new location and not knowing anyone. When you were setting up your business, you said you did pro bono work for a year before you really started doing the work. Who were you, quote unquote, marketing yourself to? Are you, um, as a business, do you work with the college or prospective college student or do you work with the schools and then the schools provide you that the students i work with the prospective college students okay uh, when the schools if the schools do want to work with you that that is definitely um a plus but it's going out it's, it's finding those folks so the so originally i was working with the youth group at our church okay so i so that was my that was my my test group, I said, okay, I'm going to work with these, these young folks because they were all, you know, the high school kids were all college bound and work with them. And then as you start going out to these other organizations, um, you know, I had spoken like at the Kiwanis Club and, and I was doing free workshops at the, um, at the uh, library branches. So I had connected with one of the librarians there and she put me in contact with the woman that was in charge of youth services who then passed my information on to the eight branches, which was nice. And they put me on the calendar to come to their branch and do, you know, to do a community, a free community workshop. So it was doing a lot of that, just getting out in front of people um, and not charging for it, just so they would get to know who you are, because it is different. And people would say to me, oh, are you a nonprofit? And I'm like, no, I'm not a nonprofit. I'm a for-profit. They go, well, how do you get paid? I said, my family's paid me. I'm like, oh, so that was a whole piece too, figuring out what, what to charge for your services. Now, being a school counselor, I just want to give everything away. 
you, know, you, just, you, know, you just want to help your kids. And one of my friends who is a director of a school counseling um, district in Rhode Island, she said, I know you, I know you're giving away your time. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm giving away more than I'm getting paid for. I said, but I, I'm, I'm still uh, establishing my brand out here. Mm -hmm. People don't know me, so I just want to do that. When you're doing these sessions uh, with families, um, are, are you regional or do you have an expertise in sending them nationwide to college or, or how does that work? So I work with students um, locally and nationally. I even work with students internationally. I had, um, I worked with a, a, a student last year who um, they were actually stationed in Germany. Okay. They, they had been here at Fort Bragg, so I knew them from here. But then when they moved over, you know, uh, mom and dad wanted him to continue with, with um, counseling because, you know, they didn't know him there. He was new there. So I worked with him. Um, I, ha I just picked up a student. I'm just working now with a student that's located in South Africa. Um, you know, because of her dad's um, employment. So that's good. So I worked with students, you know, here um, in all parts of North Carolina and other states. Um, the best way usually that I get, get new, new families is through referral, um, but through word of mouth families will say, oh, you know, this is so-and-so. One of my best referrals though, this is something, this goes back to something my grandmother taught me. My grandmother told me you should always write thank you always write people thank you notes. So one of the things we do within the regional group I belong to is um, college admission representatives. When they're going out visiting high school, they'll meet up with our group on their off time and tell us about their college and you know what's going on in their school. Um, so one time we, we had met with one representative and I always write thank you notes after we meet with the college rep. So maybe about three weeks later, he sent me a, a message and he said, that was so nice coming back off the road and there was a thank you note there. That was like so cool. And then he said, oh, by the way, I referred you to one of my fraternity brothers. He was saying, you know, that he wanted to work with someone privately for, for his daughter, but he didn't know how to go about doing it. And he goes, oh, so I gave him your name. And I'm like, oh, that's good. Because I said, this man doesn't, I said, but you don't really know me. He said, but you wrote a thank you note. That says <laughs> a lot about your values. And I said, that's awesome. oh. so I didn't hear from the, person he referred me to but then I saw the admission rep at a college fair and I and went over and talked to him he goes did he ever call you I said no but that that's okay just the fact that you referred me is nice within two weeks that gentleman called me <laughs> I worked with both of his kids and they were in Virginia so that was another state I worked with both of his kids then he referred me to two other families so it just you know so it mushrooms that way so mm -hmm. again if you do good work and you really make that connection with your families, they will definitely, um, you know, speak highly of your, of your work. Well, and I think it says something, um, word of mouth referrals is my number one source of business as a business owner, right? And this goes back to uh, begin with, and we do staffing and recruiting, and we help military spouses and veterans find jobs with defense contractors. But the way we started was by career coaching and resume writing services, and we still do that, um, but our primary function at this point is as a staffing firm. And to this day, even if I don't advertise anything about resume writing or things like that, people from two years ago are still referring our resume writing services out to their friends. Um, and it's, I've tried, but I can't get rid of it, the resume writing portion. Um, and I figure if the demand is still there, why lop it off yet? You know, I can, I can still provide those services and I've brought on team members to facilitate that since I'm only one person and can't do all the things, but it's amazing. Word of mouth referrals are ideal for business owners. Sure. Like you and I, but for job seekers. Um, and so when we're talking about, even if you're just looking for a traditional nine to five job, or even maybe working remotely from home for a regular employer and you're not running your own business, that's how you get jobs your friend tells their boss about you and then suddenly their boss is giving you a call and trying to get you in for an interview. It's, it's amazing how that works. So and that was, that was the lesson I had to learn because like I said, I had been in the workforce in Rhode Island all of my life. So I wasn't ever you know, out there looking for a job. And then you moved here and I'm like, well, what do you mean people don't respond back after you apply? You know, I didn't know that had become a thing <laughs> and you never hear anything. And I'm like, what is this? What did I do wrong? Did they not get it? And then I find out, oh, this ghosting is a whole whole way of doing business. Like, oh my goodness. I said, 
this is terrible. I said, so I said, I will never in any kind of capacity I may ghost anybody because it feels horrible. It feels horrible. And, and I had to get used to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, um, it is a, you know, if you think about it as a job seeker and you apply for that high level position at the Fortune 500 company, there's probably a couple thousand people applying for the same job. And so if you think about the recruiters on the receiving end, they can only do so much and they have to weed people out. And a lot of the time, at best, you might get an automatically generated email saying that your resume has been passed over. And then sometimes if it's not a company with those systems in place, you just don't hear anything at all. And it's, it's tough. But as a job seeker, those are red flags that maybe you should focus your energy on building that network and on getting those word of mouth referrals instead of trying to ace the computer and get through that. Um, that's really tough. You're so, you're so right about that. It, I've learned that networking is about relationships. You know, I, I, it was funny because I, I thought I, after, you know, getting so many um, rejections or not hearing back from places and, and figuring out how to do networking, I actually went back to my school counseling training. And I said, school counseling is all about building a relationship with your student. You can't help your student if you don't have a relationship. So I said, all right, Belinda, this is what you need to do. You need to go back to that relationship building. Don't look for customers. Don't look for families to buy your services. Just talk with people. Just find out what's going on with people. What's going on? Just have conversations. That's it. And I really started just, just having conversations. And then it leads to, oh, so what do you do? And you just say what you do. And oh, well, I don't need your services now, but I'll take a card because I might know somebody that does. And you just, oh, thank you so much. And then when somebody does refer you, you make sure you let them know, whether it's through a gift card or something else that, that you appreciate them referring you. Um, so again, it's, it's really, I mean, everything we do is about relationships. I mean, even as a teacher, I had to have a relationship with those students if they were going to sit there and pay attention to my class. Mm -hmm. so it's going back to that basic training. Yep. It's a really tough, uh, in, as a business owner, and you know this now, is that there's kind of two sides to the coin is you've got the business end of things and then you've got the relationship end of things. But I find that they coexist together very nicely because business tends to go well if you have a strong relationship. Um, and if you're treating your job, in my case, as kind of as think of me as a headhunter, I have to get job seekers a position and I have to find people to fill these roles for companies. And so I'm wearing the business to business hat and the business to customer hat. Um, but I tend to find that the stronger the relationships are on both sides, the better business is going for me. Um, and that's something that as I bring team members on and things like that is the focus is um, quality, not quantity. We aren't, you know, herding cattle here. We're not trying to get 200 people through the door. We're trying to get some quality candidates for these folks so that they don't have to do as much work on their end as the company. And then we get these people jobs. And that's really the positive impact on the military community that we're trying to make. And so um, when we are talking, I'm going to transition a little bit. We're coming up sort of to the close of our lunch and learn hour. And I just want to drop a quick message to anyone that's listening. Uh, if you have questions for myself or for Belinda, please drop them in the comments, send us a message, and you will see her contact information as well here in the comments or in the post itself. So um, just feel free to reach out anytime you have a question. Um, and then we're happy to answer those. And just give us a like, give us a love, let us know you were here watching today. Um, and to sort of kind of close out our discussion for this Lunch and Learn, let's talk about community. Um, we've talked a lot about reestablishing ourself as both a job seeker and maybe even a business owner in a new community, building your network. Um, let's talk about giving back. Yes, that, that became very important to me. I think the first thing I did, one of the first things I did when I moved here, I love to read. So one of the first things I did was to get my library card. So I used to hang out in the library all the time. And I was looking for opportunities to volunteer. I said, all right, you know, I, I can't find work right now, but I've got to have a, a reason, a purpose to get out of the house. Um, I saw a, a notice in the paper where um, the child, the local child advocacy center here in Fayetteville was looking for 
volunteers and the Child Advocacy Center works with um, young folks who have allegedly um, experienced sexual abuse. I, I responded to that um, ad, went in for orientation and actually spent five, six years as a volunteer there while I was also trying to build my business. And it went from just being somebody that kind of stuffed envelopes to um, helping to plan major conferences for them. Um, and it was, and it was great. It was, it was just, it was what I needed because it helped give me a purpose. Then, you know, I, um, I volunteer. Oh, I went Wednesday. So I, one of the times when I was doing one of these free um, community presentations at the library, one of the librarians at, at a branch said to me, Oh, we have this youth group that, um, you know, youth program that meets Monday through Friday. So any day you want to come back and talk to the kids, it's wonderful. So I said, oh, well, maybe I'll come back Tuesday. So the name of the group, it's called Chillax. Um, chill, <laughs> chilling and Relax, or Chillax. And um, I went back that following Tuesday. And this coming school year would be, uh, will be year number six that I go, like, every Tuesday from, like, you know, 3.30 to 5 or 3.30 to 5.30. And it's just an informal college and career counseling asking about, you know, their grades, what are they doing? So the kids range in age from middle school to high school. So I do that. And then because I love the library and I'm always talking to people about books, I was at a vending um, opportunity and had a conversation with the, with the woman. And next thing I know, she's emailing me, asking me if I will, um, would I be interested in being appointed to the board of trustees for the Cumberland County Public Library System? I'm like, mm. Are you kidding me? I said, I, what do I need to do? So I did the application. The county commissioners appointed me. So this year, I'm actually the chair of the board of trustees. Wow. Of library assistant. So I've made myself, you know, a place here. But you have to work on it because it's not going to come and, and get you. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to do that volunteer work. And I mean, I loved everything I was doing at the Child Advocate. Center. And the only reason I stopped was because I decided I needed to put more energy into my business and I was doing the volunteer work at the library. So, you know, and again, just, just always finding those volunteer opportunities because they're here. They're everywhere. People always need volunteers for something. So, you know, just putting yourself out there. Well, and I find as a recruiter and, you know, I think about military spouses specifically who have large resume gaps um, I think volunteering, I hate telling people to go out and to do free work, um, for the sake of, you know, not having, you know, if you're unemployed in this community, it's really tough, 24% unemployment for military spouses. And a lot of the time it's almost kind of thrown at you that you have to volunteer if you're a military spouse. And I do believe people should get paid for their work and paid their worth, but at the same time, the thing that I hate as a recruiter when I'm looking at a resume is seeing really big gaps. And it's not because I think that the person is lazy, but I see a problem and that, that problem is skill atrophy. If you haven't actively done you know, software systems in five or six years, you may not know how to jump on and use Microsoft Word as well anymore. And your learning curve when you get to that new job is gonna be higher and the employer that I'm trying to fill the job for is going to have to train you more. Um, and so I think of, you know, if you're actively volunteering, even if it's just part time, keeping your skill set up is a huge thing for me. Um, I don't care what the volunteer position is. I just care that you are actively engaging and doing some form of work. And ideally, if it's possible, uh, to keep it in the ballpark of your skill set. So, you know, maybe if you work in the education realm, volunteer teaching or, or things like that, where you're keeping your facilitation skills up to par. Um, so that's what I like to see as a recruiter is volunteerism to kind of help fill those gaps and more importantly, to avoid skill atrophy. And especially when it comes to using technology, because that's the thing that you lose the fastest um, you know, is technology advances really quickly. And if you're not going with it, then you're getting behind. So I know that that's one of the things I had to learn being, being a business owner is I'm a, I'm also my IT person. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to learn a lot real fast. YouTube, YouTube, um, videos are my best 
go to for helping me figure out how to do something. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. <laughs> so I think you brought up something that's hugely important to me, and it's sort of the namesake of my company. Um, begin within. It doesn't seem like it would be the name for a career uh, organization, but the the logo, if you take a look at it, is three rings that are intertwined, and those represent um, your career, your life, your personal life, and then you as the tie that binds them both together. And so Begin Within is all about fulfilling your purpose. And I think that when we talk about giving back to your community, when we talk about volunteerism, or even our profession, it's hugely important to mix your vocation with your avocation. And this is something you hit the nail on the head, talking about volunteering and giving back to the community as during that time you needed a purpose. Um, and that's something that I really truly believe in pursuing as a job seeker, as a business owner, and as a human being in general. Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right about that, Jamie. Being, having the opportunity to serve on the board of trustees for the library, it's, it's funny, it's almost like this childhood dream. I can remember at five years old getting my first library card and being thrilled that I could go to this place and get all these books. And now that I'm able, and it's not even related to my business, but now that I'm able to you know, spread that joy of literacy and reading to people. I mean, I was just online the other day saying, hey, do you know that we can do curbside pickup at the library even though it's closed? No, I didn't know that. Yes, and they're doing virtual storytelling. Yes, get online. It's all there um, and, and the system works perfectly. I said, I tried it the first day it opened up and, it, and it's fine, it's great. So again, that giving back to your community but finding something that, that speaks to your purpose, that speaks to your heart, really makes it, it makes it, 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 it takes the sting out of not getting paid for it. <laughs> for a while anyway. <laughs> but it does, but at least you're out there and you know that you're doing something that you feel good about and it's helping somebody. And the, the, the thing is that if you're doing something you're truly passionate about, whether you're a volunteer or not, the fact of the matter is that if there's volunteer positions for it, there's also paid positions for it somewhere. You know, whether you're in the paid position or not, somebody is running that organization. Um, and it's possible to branch your career in that direction if that's your desire. You just have to be very conscientious about your volunteer performance. Um, nobody's gonna pick you up and hire you as an employee if you're not performing um, and if you're not taking your volunteer role seriously. So I always tell people, no matter what you're doing, whether it's an entry level job and you're overqualified, whether you're volunteering or whether the position that you're doing is one that you just hate in general, always take it seriously, work your butt off and perform. And that leads to better opportunities in the future. So that is so true. I, I agree with that a thousand percent because you never know who's watching you. Yep. <laughs> you know, I used to say that, you know, when I was a teacher, you know, your kids, Kids are watching everything you do, even when you think they're not. So you need to be on your best game at all times. And it's the same thing when you're a volunteer. Don't go in there and slack off. Don't think, well, it's just a volunteer position. Well, so I'll come in a half hour late. No, don't do that. If they expect you there at one o'clock, then you're there at 1255. You know, don't, don't do that. You know, because again, you're, you know, it's, it's funny going from being a you know public school educator to an entrepreneur and, and thinking about this whole thing about branding, we brand ourselves as people too. And and we don't think about it that way. But we but you are, you know, you can brand yourself as, as the volunteer who is gonna give a thousand percent. And that carries, like you said, a lot of weight when somebody's looking to fill a position. So again, so you're your own ambassador. So you have to remember every time you walk out the door. Uh, you know, I'm not in the business of people pleasing, but you really do in the professional sense, you need to be conscientious about your brand. Um, and it's not to please people, but it's about professional development. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, sharpening your skills. And that goes hand in hand with sharpening your reputation as well uh, in the professional workplace. And, you usually this experience as well, I'm sure. Um, 
your personal reputation bleeds over into your professional life because those word of mouth referrals often comes from friends and family and people, you know, from church and your community organizations. And so it all comes full circle and um, you've got to be conscientious about that brand and how you portray yourself to those um, in your inner circle, as well as in your professional circles. That is so true. And one of the things we talk to our students a lot is about how, um, how they're, how they portray themselves on social media. Oh, yes. <laughs> a question about, do you have a business Facebook page and a personal Facebook page? Do you let them blend over? So do you have multiple? And I said, well, I have, and I remember I, I was, this businesswoman was giving, um, giving, a, giving a seminar. And one of the things she said really stuck with me. She said, as much as you want to separate the, your personal from, from your business, you are your business. So you have to figure out how that works for you. So I tell people, I said, yeah, I have my, on my, on my personal um, Facebook page, I said, but I'm also cognizant when I'm posting on there that I'm not there trying to change anybody's politics or religion or anything. I'm not there to argue with people. Um, it's, it's very, I keep it, I keep it civil at all times and I'm never calling any, I said, I don't, I said, because I am my brand, but also I don't do that kind of stuff on social media. <laughs> you know, I just don't do that. Um, so it is interesting, you know, cause we do talk with our students a lot about it, Would you be okay with your grandmother reading what you're putting on social media? Well, you know, as a recruiter, I'll put this hat on really quickly. You know, it's all about LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And that's what we tell you to do. Cause yes, I look at LinkedIn, but the first place I usually go, especially when we're talking about younger folks, um, the millennials and younger I go to Facebook and then I also go to Instagram and I try to look up Twitter. Um, and this is because I know that people are going to do their naughty things on those other platforms. And if I need to, to monitor and catch red flags before sending talent to a company, I have to check everything. Um, and so if it's somebody that I'm seriously interested in sending forward, especially the younger they are, um, and I check Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, um, and make sure they're squared away. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind as people yeah. are out there looking for you. Um, the only time I struggle is if it's somebody with a really common name um, and then I can't find their platform, which is probably good for them in, in terms of hiding a little bit, but. <laughs> yeah, but that is, that's the major conversation that we have with our students. Mm -hmm. our Really, really good to keep in mind. LinkedIn is wonderful and I encourage everybody to use it, but we are looking at those other platforms as well. You know, there's eyes on them, so be cognizant of them. Um, so Belinda, we are wrapping up our hour. We have about five minutes left. I was hoping that you could just give the audience the skinny, let them know where they can find you online, the best way to contact you, um, and then if you have anything upcoming or any events, then now's the time to, to let us know. We'll drop the link in the comments and then um, we'll hopefully, you know, uh, Belinda and I will be available to answer any questions that you may have later. Okay. So uh, again, um, Belinda Wilkerson with Steps to the Future. You can always reach me on my Facebook page, um, Steps to the Future. Uh, on the Facebook page, it's the number two, Steps to the Future. You can find me on Twitter. Steps to the Future. I'm on Instagram, Steps to the Future. You can find me on LinkedIn, Belinda Wilkerson. And every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Daylight Time, depending upon what time of year it is, I do a Facebook Live. Actually, um, this coming Saturday, I'm actually doing a, a, a small webinar training on three strategies to improve your LinkedIn profile. Wonderful. That is on my face. That is advertised on my Facebook page. And you just have to um, register at, at the link. And, and if they are late to that event, is it going to be recorded anywhere for them? I am going to record it. So if people register and they can't make the event, um, I will be able to send them out the link to it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, so it's doing those on, um, you can, you know, my um, email is Dr. B. Um, D O C T O R B at steps to the future with the number two dot com. But if you just go on my uh, website, steps to the future dot com, all of my contact information is there. And we will have that 
in the comments or in the post here for you so that way it's easy to click and get to. Um, but I appreciate your time today, Belinda. You are just wonderful to listen to. You're a really wonderful storyteller. In the beginning, I was just listening to you talking about relocating like I've never moved myself before. Like, oh, I really relate to this story. It's amazing. So I appreciate your time and your wisdom. And um, in the future, our audience reaching out to you and your willingness to answer any questions they may have. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.